Okay. So, uh, so Lucas did a great job of saying, okay, we have a lot of problems. Uh, uh, the way we solve problems is to make better decisions. So I'm all about making better decisions. The problem with making better decisions is we have to deal with a lot of uncertainties. Uh, so I'm going to mainly focus more on an energy side of the equation, but the broader theme here will be dealing with uh, making decisions under uncertainty. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little overview of some of the different types of uncertainties we run into with energy. Uh, for example, we're trying to build portfolios. Now, now when you look at this portfolio, you see familiar technologies. However, look at these again and, and you'll see nuclear energy that you have to plan a year in advance, uh, coal and uh, steam generation that has to be planned a day in advance, gas turbines that have to be planned an hour in, a, in advance, uh, batteries that can be done uh, totally real time, but sometimes you have to think minutes to hours uh, into the future. Uh, we heard a lot about renewables. Uh, uh, this is wind energy, a familiar map. Uh, wind doesn't blow uniformly everywhere, which is a major problem in the United States. It's mainly up and down the Midwest. When you actually take a look at uh, energy generated, these are the uh, wind farms, about five gigawatts of capacity uh, from one of the big power grids of PGM that serves the mid-Atlantic states. You see a lot of variability. You'll see a, a predictable seasonal pattern. Wind tends to drop in the summertime. But when you look at it on a finer time scale, you see very high variability. Uh, it's going from as much as 5,000 megawatts to 1,000 megawatts in a matter of hours. Uh, okay, so this is a large variability. Um, here's our ability to forecast. This is the actual set of forecast uh, provided by a German vendor uh, to PGM. The black line is the actual. Uh, this blue line is the this blue line is the forecast starting at midnight, and with each passing hour, the forecasts are updated. And you can see the forecasts aren't very good. So this is what we refer to with uncertainty. That is, when we try to forecast something and we can't and it changes, this is uncertainty. This is where we end up using this word stochastic. Um, solar energy. So we think of solar energy as mainly you know, the southwest of the country. Uh, people don't fully appreciate uh, one of the great reasons to come to Princeton is that we live in the sunshine state. <laughs> Well, let's say we collect a lot of sunshine because we have a very aggressive uh, uh, program subsidizing solar. So uh, we've got a lot of solar panels in New Jersey. Uh, this is the uh, solar from uh, 23 uh, utility scale solar farms, the biggest utility runs. Once again, like wind, you see, hey, we have less uh, sun in the wintertime, predictably. Uh, there does seem to be a lot of variability, and I know this is a smart audience. We're realizing, okay, I actually know where some of that variability comes. The sun sets. So let's th once again think about this timing. I can predict when the sun's going to rise and set years into the future. Uh, but look at this data. We also have what are clearly sunny days and cloudy days. So everybody who's looked at an app, we've we're pretty good at predicting when tomorrow is going to be really sunny or really cloudy. And then we have these wacky days where things sort of just fly around. And we can't even predict solar an hour in advance on a short term time scale. So once again, we see this ability to, or inability to forecast. There's some things we can forecast perfectly and others we can't. Electricity prices. If I want to do anything with energy, I've, I've got to make money with it. Uh, this is a heat map of electricity prices around uh, uh, the, the central and Midwestern grid operators. Uh, if you look at this right now, New Jersey is having to pay $58 per megawatt. Uh, but this thing could fly up to uh, 977. Here we have a lot of congestion in the east. By the way, those, those blue pockets are really cold. That's where wind farms are. So they're getting a lot of energy from wind, but they have congestion, which is why we can't always get it to the east coast. So we have a lot of variability. If you actually look at the electricity price data over the course of the year, you see a lot of variability. And yes, prices can go negative. There's times when the, the, the power generator just doesn't want to shut down, says, would somebody please take my electricity? Now, you'll see variations as high as $1,800 per megawatt hour down to minus 500. A lot of fluff in between. The average is 22. <laughs> Uh, which is really low, by the way. In fact, it's so low, it's squeezing nuclear power out of the system. But you have to deal with this type of uncertainty when you're making investments. So if you want to come online with more renewables investments, this is something that the finance guys have to think about because at the end of the day, and Microsoft certainly knows this, whatever we do has to pay for itself. It has to make money. 
we just started a major project with Brazil. So Brazil is a country that mainly runs on hydro. Uh, they've got a lot of water, but they're also in the midst of their worst drought in 80 years. Uh, by the way, hydro, uh, Brazil has very sophisticated capabilities in, in modeling and planning their hydroelectric facility. Uh, this is rainfall over three years. You see it's highly variable. Um, so there's a lot of uncertainty. They're actually quite good. In fact, Brazil has pioneered some of the, the major algorithmic technologies uh, for dealing with uncertainty. But their idea of a planning model is to go out 10 years in one week increments. Uh, one week is their smallest time step. So with their drought, they've been investing very heavily in wind energy. And the time scale is completely different. So this is where they've uh, asked us to come in because we're really good at modeling wind and the smaller time scales. We're going to try to get everything together. Um, by the way, if you want to make investments in fixed capacity, you're going to have to deal with commodity prices. This is a natural gas going up to as high as $14 per million BTU. Uh, for a period of time, it was running around $4 per million BTU, spiking to 120. Basically, New York ran out of gas. And uh, we, we just ran out, and the prices went crazy. Uh, but this is another type of uncertainty, commodity uncertainty. Uh, if you look today, earlier this year, uh, gas prices were around a buck seventy or buck eighty. Now they're back up to three dollars. So all the people have to make these investments have to deal with a horrendous amount of uncertainty. One way to deal with the variability of wind and solar is what's called demand response. Let's get the market help out. Let's, let's get us to help out that, you know, if the, if the cloud comes out or the wind dies, maybe we can back off on our load. Maybe we can up prices and, and get a response and get people to reduce their load. What's the response? Well, that gets a little wacky too. We don't always know. We have a lot of uncertainty about how the market will respond. If I actually try a price, I'm going to get a noisy response from that. So now I have to learn those curves, and probably those curves are changing over time. Now, there is uncertainty inside the lab. Maybe I'm trying to come up with the next uh, uh, carbon nanotube to help me with the breakthrough in battery storage. Uh, inside, when I'm trying to understand these chemical processes, there's complex dynamics. There's uncertainty in these parameters. By the way, this is model uncertainty, just like the uncertainty in the demand response. But now I'm talking about experiments inside the lab, and I have to make the decision of what experiment to do. Uh, this is a series of heat maps that show the impact uh, the, of, of, of pressure and, and the concentration of a particular chemical under 25 different truths. My job is to run expensive experiments to figure out which one of these truths is correct so I know the right combination of, of temperatures and concentrations. So one of the things we have to do when we're understanding variability is to distinguish between predictable variability, such as the sun setting, and stochastic uncertainty, which comes in all these different flavors. Uh, some of it uh, very spiky. Uh, the different types of uncertainty here have to be modeled. So one of the things that my community likes to focus on is making the best decisions. But one of the themes that I'll be bringing out is as we work with real problems, not just proving theorems and, you know, and, and doing the usual stuff that, that, that academics do, uh, if you want to actually solve a real problem, you're going to end up spending a lot of time modeling. Okay? So we'd like to come up with optimization and optimize this, that, and the other thing. But to optimize, you have to optimize a model. We need the right model. Modeling is a really big deal. So I'm going to talk now about modeling. So modeling is a really interesting thing. Modeling is sort of the, 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 the forgotten cousin of algorithms because you know if you want to optimize something, if you want to make a decision, if we want to improve the world, you have to make this better decisions. The way we do that analytically, you have to do it from a model. So the problem with modeling is when you put uncertainty is, please pick me out a book that you'd like to use. Uh, when you do deterministic optimization, there's basically one or two methods. If you come from operations research, we know what linear programming is. The controls people have their own way of modeling that's also very widely used. As long as it's deterministic, it's fine. But you put uncertainty in there, and it's a mess. And I've started calling that the jungle of stochastic optimization because in every one of these books, and by the way, you can spend an entire PhD career. There's a lot of people who've spent entire academic careers in one of these fields. Okay, and so. And, and then you get these people saying, oh, I think dynamic programming is better than stochastic programming, you know, and, and, and you get these debates. And these are quite actively, this is very actively happening. One of the things that you'll find is if you go into any one of these books, they don't agree on how to model a problem. So I'm going to just give you a quick overview of here's how to model sequential decision problems, any sequential decision problem. And I am not biased toward any of those books. At the end, I'm going to be sort of saying, okay, I think all these books add value. 
Uh, yes, one of those books had my name on it, Approximate Dynamic Programming. Uh, uh, the simple fact is, is people think, oh, he's up here to pitch ADP. No, no, actually, I've sort of moved past that. Uh, ADP is great, but then so is everything else. Everything's great. It's just there's such a wide diversity of problems, you need them all. So you can boil down and model everything in these five, any problem in these five core steps. Uh, states, so let's talk about notation a little bit. If you're a controls person, X is a state. Uh, everyone else uses S for state, and I like that better. Um, uh, I'm going to use S for state, and state variables tend to come in one of three flavors. A resource state, how much energy is in the battery? Uh, is my power plant turned on? I is other information like prices and weather. Uh, K is the interesting one. Now this is state of knowledge. This is where there's something out there where I just don't know it perfectly. This is that model uncertainty, parameter uncertainty. Uh, in the world of computational sustainability, there's a lot of uncertainty. There are problems where the only state variable is K, the state of knowledge. That's the only thing. And those are called learning problems or bandit problems. There's problems out there where the only state variables are. I'm managing some resources. Uh, and then there's problems where they're all in there. And as you go to these different books, you'll find the books where like, they think of uncertainty is, well, you're managing R subject to uncertainty. There's books in there where the only thing is K. Those are called the multi-arm bandit problems. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm going to say, no, everything is a state. Um, Decisions, there seem to be three basic notational systems for decisions. Most, not all of the time, A is a discrete action. The engineers like to use U. It's usually a low dimensional continuous variable. If you come from my community of operations research, it's called X. And I like to use X because it is universally used around the world uh, under this language called linear programming. And uh, anybody from around the world set up a linear program, you're going to use X. As your, as your decision variable. Uh, the operation research people don't think any problem is interesting unless you have at least 100,000 dimensions to x. They don't tell you that on the side they have convexity, which is a wonderfully powerful property. There's some really important hard problems where a small number of discrete actions is a very important hard problem, like what type of catalyst to use and what types of energy technology. So all of these problems are interesting. Uh, using x, let me just mention that x, all of these, again, are important problems. You can have binomial, like A-B testing. Do I do A versus B? There's a lot of problems where it's a small number of finite sets. You'll see a lot of that in the computer science community. Uh, you'll see computer scientists using finite or categorical, where x is a vector of multidimensional. The operations research people love anything with a vector. You know, oh, it's, you know, it's got to be. You know, optimizing huge systems. So the different communities tend to carve off problems of different characteristics. Information. Boy, is this a piece of uh, an important part of a model where there is simply not standard notation. Uh, the computer scientists picked up a bad habit from the Markov decision process community where they have a one-step transition matrix and buried inside that is anything random, but they never model it explicitly. Then there's other communities where there's just no standard notation. I spent a lot of time, I'm in a heavily stochastics department talking to my academic friends and said, okay, we finally settled in on capital W as our generic variable. W is information that first became known at time t. Now, when you model real problems, you can't always use W. You've got to use prices and resources and energy, and they can be uppercase and they can be lowercase. And I said, fine, just put hats on them all. But all of them become known at time t. Because I just, I'm like, OK, I can't live with one notation. You, you, you'll talk to the mathematicians. To be random, it has to be capital letters. You know? And they're, they're very insistent on this. Oh, it's not random unless it's capital. And furthermore, if it is capital, it must be random. The simple fact is, if it's indexed type by t, it's not random at time t. So nothing in there, everything there is random before time t, and it's not random after time t. So that whole notational, it's funny to go into system communities and you realize, boy, they've got this notational system. It just doesn't work. Anyway, I have modeled a lot of complex problems with this system. Um, the transition function, oh, by the way, I skipped over something. I'm sorry. Policies. So over here, we're going to be working on coming up with this thing called a policy. A policy is a rule for making a decision. Give me a state, here's an action. And for the moment, I'm just going to say whatever notation you like. If you like x for a decision, which I'll be doing, capital X superscript pi is a policy. The letter pi says, here's the, the structure of the policy. I, I have to mention that because I'm going to come back to that. 
uh, transition functions. Now, this is a very simple piece of notation, widely used in engi engineering and not really used outside of engineering. The controls people know this, and people who learn control theory, like, oh, transition function, sure. But then you'll go to the, 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 the reinforcement learning community and they want a one-step transition matrix. And the operations research people want systems of linear equations. And uh, so it's a very powerful piece of notation. There's a reason why the engineers like it. It works. Uh, and, and, and by the way, if you go through the literature, there's a, about a dozen different names. Now, how well have we done? Okay, so this gets tricky. How well are we doing? How do we measure performance? So in operations research, we'll call it cost or profit, but really there's all kinds of words. Cost, contributions, gains, losses, rewards, stability, entropy, errors, faults, on and on and on. And furthermore, as you work on any real world problem, there will be multiple objectives. Uh, when you're dealing with uncertainty, do we uh, minimize, maximize an average or an expectation or we deal with risk? Uh, risk is very important. Computationally, it's hard to work with. However, many would argue that the biggest issue here is risk. Okay, we want to minimize expectations, but risk matters. Okay, and it runs throughout energy. Notational systems, whether, I, I don't really care so much what letter you like to use here, cost or contribution, I'll sometimes, but there will be uh, communities, especially in dynamic programming, where the, whatever your metric is, it's a function of state and action, or state action and information. Uh, the model free people want state action and then new state, and then there's problems where it's not a function of the state at all. It's a function of decision and new information. So all of these are, are notational systems that use. To understand computation, you have to go into what are the properties of that function? Is it convex? Is it continuous? Is it smooth, unimodal? Uh, is it something that you can just compute easily, an analytic function? Is it, a, is it a numerical simulation? Is it a complex numerical simulation that takes hours or a day to run? Is it something that you're actually doing in a laboratory? It's not even on the computer at all. I have to run a computer experiment. Or maybe I have to do a field experiment, and computing this function uh, you know, can take weeks or months uh, just to know, you know how well I've done. So we have to be aware of this wide range of different types of functions. So roughly, it sort of all comes down to this, where we have a cost or contribution or reward or loss or gain or something that depends on a state and an action. But I don't know the state at time t, so I don't, can't tell you the action, but it depends on the state. So I use this thing called a policy that says, if you tell me the state, I'll tell you the action, plus the new information, sometimes, depending on the model. We have to do something to take an average or a risk measure or something to deal with the fact that there's many different sample realizations. Am I going to average these things? Am I going to take the upper tail? You have to have some sort of an operator there. Uh, it depends on the initial state. There's a lot of problems where we have an initial state of belief. Anybody who's done Bayesian modeling, uh, you have to have this. And now we have the problem of finding the best policy. So uh, this is an interesting graph. I only put this together a few months ago. I want to break down sort of four classes of problems based on whether the rewards are offline or online. Offline means I'm off in the lab or the computer doing something and finding the best design that I can go to the field and says, here's the best design. Online means I have to experience it. I actually have to try something and then see how it works and then try it again. Uh, let's start with the offline reward. The, that top one, the max over x, that is our vanilla uh, uh, problem of, you know, almost all stochastic optimization problems boil down to that. In operations research, we love to use the example of the news vendor problem where you pick a quantity x and then you take the smaller of x in a random demand, let's call it w, you earn a reward p per unit, you had to buy the quantity x. So this is something where the quantity x, if, if it's too small, you're giving away too much demand, but as it's too big, you have times when you exceed the demand and you have an overage, underage, overage trade-off. But I'm just going to use that as just, if you do anything with resource allocation, somewhere it'll boil down to a news vendor problem, but there's a lot of problems that are not news vendor. However, that news vendor formulation, max over x, I mean, this goes back to 1951, Robinson Monroe doing stochastic gradient methods, very well known. By the way, almost never, that, that is what I'll call the asymptotic formulation, because you're almost never actually solving that. Usually we're doing something in finite time. And if you do it in finite time, you end up having to find a policy, otherwise known as an algorithm. Now, 
Let's take my news vendor problem. I, I only realized this year that the very classical formulation of a news vendor problem looks like a terrible formulation because in a real news vendor problem, you put out newspapers, you see how much money you make. Then you put out newspapers again, and you actually have to accumulate rewards. So this is the cumulative reward. Computer scientists call this cumulative regret. They call the other one simple regret. Uh, if you come down here, this is your vanilla dynamic program. Uh, if you twist the arm of people doing dynamic programming, reinforcement learning, Q learning, anything like that, they'll eventually admit, yeah, that, that, that's the actual problem being solved. And yet this community doesn't really realize that this is, these two are really similar. And yet this is always solved offline and this is the online, otherwise known as the multi-arm bandit problem. Which leaves the last problem over here, which I only just discovered, has never really been formulated, says, well, if this is really the online dynamic program, what's the offline dynamic program, which is what we're actually solving? And that's one over here. I don't have time to get into that, but if anybody likes that sort of stuff. But at the end of the day, you can pull all of these problems together, and there's this circle of stochastic optimization problems that all end up back at the same problem, just by manipulating notation. Okay, so in other words, this really is the vanilla problem at the top, and you can create all the different variations of problems. So there's three classes of computational problems, uh, computational issues. One is time scales, uh, the other is modeling uncertainty, and the last is designing policies. It looks like I'll only have time to get through these. One thing about energy is time scales. Uh, it goes all the way from literally fractions of a second to years and everything in between. And often we're trying to cut across time scales, and that's an is issue because I may be optimizing a battery over a day, having to deal with decisions in two-second increments, so I have about 40,000 time periods. Modeling uncertainty. Uh, gosh, you know, the first thing about modeling uncertainty is to recognize what types of uncertainty are out there. So we have to go from the unknown unknowns to the known unknowns. Simply recognizing what is unknown is a big deal. Uh, in sustainability, I would say this is huge. If we could simply say, before we start making good decisions, we have to understand what it is that we simply don't know and just at least articulate that. Uh, when we're doing forecasting of wind, uh, black is the forecast, the red is the actual. Uh, here we're working to do stochastic modeling. We love it when we can get the error distribution to look good. This was pretty good. At one point I thought it was really good. Uh, then I started paying attention to things like how much time I'm over the forecast or under the forecast. We call these crossing time distributions. These are really hard to match. And so we spent a lot of time, came up with a hidden Markov model that amazingly does really well. If I look at these things, we were about three years coming up with this model. So three years simply modeling the uncertainty. Now it was so easy, and there are hundreds of papers that model wind as some sort of a time series. It doesn't work very well. Because the crossing times matter, because what really matters is not just the error distribution, but if you go below the forecast, how long did you stay below the forecast? Designing policies, okay, all of those jungle of books can be boiled down into two basic strategies for designing policies, and it covers every book on that picture. Okay, I think I started a little late. Okay. So I'm misleading time for questions. Yeah, okay. Um, but if you I think I started a few minutes late, so. <laughs> Sorry, it's, it's a little tight. Uh, I mean, I can just cut the, the, talk, sh the talk short, but uh, there are two basic strategies to design a, po a policy. One is called policy search. Uh, the other is look aheads, where you approximate the look ahead in some way and everything boils down. And by the way, that covers all of us human beings. Every time you made a decision, you use some form of a policy. And it's a neat challenge to say, every time you made a decision, Boy, now these two break into, into two more each. Under policy search, you can minimize or max, you can use some sort of analytical policy that says in this state, take this action. Or, and I'm not gonna say much about this because this is something widely used in industry and totally ignored by the academic community. This is where you minimize or maximize an analytic function. And then in the approximation, when you look ahead, that top equation, boy, if I could solve that, I'm done. That's the optimal policy. I'm done, okay? Uh, the problem is this messy thing here. Uh, one way to handle this is to approximate it to some function called a value function, and everybody doing dynamic programming, reinforcement learning, Q learning, that type of thing, that's what they're doing. 
Um, but another way is to say, you know what, let's just approximate that. Let's just make it simpler, like maybe use a deterministic look head. There's a lot of uh, computer scientists, we'd call it Monte Carlo tree search. There's a lot of flavors of look ahead. Um, and so uh, basically it all boils down to these four classes. So there's the four fundamental policies, two based on policy search, two based on look ahead. But of these, the first three involve some kind of function approximation. So this is where the machine learning community gets into play, because all of that involves some kind of machine learning. Um, so let me, let me probably close up just with this one example. Um, I'm going to take a very trivial problem here, uh, a little basic battery storage problem. Now, there's a lot you can do with this. And by the way, I can change names from battery storage to other types of inventory problems. However, this very, very simple little problem uh, turns out you can create a lot of variations. We created five different flavors, just tweaks on this, just changing the nature of the data. And then we created five different policies. The first four are each of the four classes of policies. The fifth one is a hybrid. And we found that all of them work best on one of the variations. All of them work best. So when you sit down to solve pro uh, decision problems under uncertainty, you've got to get out of the jungle and realize that whatever you're doing, most likely you're using one of these four classes. In fact, I guarantee you're using one of these four classes or possibly a hybrid. And the thing is, sometimes you have to be aware that you have to look at all four classes because any one of them might, might work best. This is where the computational challenges rise. We have trivial little problems. I've got an undergrad working as we speak on doing something with HVAC controls to, to, to balance. We're, we're going to use room temperatures to balance against solar. Uh, and her algorithm is going to take about seven days to run. We have dramatically bigger problems where with a lot of engineering, uh, we can run the entire model in multiple hours. Uh, that's good for certain questions, not good for other questions. Even really little problems can, take, can be computationally very big. So we have computational challenges all over the place. Um, I, I'm going to claim and that the real challenge here is, is what we have to do is we have to take our traditional vision of theory versus application and realize that in between what links theory and application is computation and modeling. Uh, if you want to do computation, you have to do a model, and modeling is the beginning of taking these complex, challenging problems and turning them into something you can put on the computer. So I'll stop here. Thank you. So you described a number of different approaches for these optimization problems. Uh, Four. <laughs> the table shows five. There's a hybrid. Okay. The fifth column is a hybrid. It's a, it's a look ahead CFA type of thing. I don't know how to interpret the table, but it seems to show, the highlights seem to show that for each type of the whole problem, there is one better algorithm. Uh, and when I look at the specification of the problems, it seems to be the type of noise which is in there, the type of transitions. Uh, so uh, also type of forecast. So forecast is a really big deal. Do you have a forecast? Yes or no? Is it a good forecast or a terrible forecast? So my question is, uh, uh, do you claim that the type of the uncertainty measure you are trying to optimize does not actually <coughs> influence which class of algorithms is better? Oh, when, okay. So uncertainty measure, all of this was with expectations. So suppose that we're doing would you stand by the statement that the same algorithms are? No. No, I, I don't see why that would be. Uh, my, my feeling is that if you change to you know, some other risk measure, you'll once again still have the same classes of algorithms. Let me not call them algorithms if I could, policies. So the same classes of policies still apply. You have to use a different measure than an expectation. Uh, I don't think that if, if, if policy A works best on problem A, uh, under an expectation, I wouldn't guarantee that that would work best under a risk measure. You, you have to redo all the simulations. My main point is that most of the academic community lives in one of the classes of policies. Pretty much all of those books live in one and sometimes two classes of policies. Uh, none of them do the, what's called the cost function approximation. And there's, this community likes look ahead and this community doesn't. It's really funny. So maybe uh, the next speaker could come up and meanwhile uh, we could start. Uh, if there's a short question.
Say that question. My, uh, he, the question is, how do I come up with the notation? What's that? Yes, I am. Uh, the, the question I had to do with was, uh, how did I come up with the notation? Let me tell you, it took a career. Because the problem with notation is, so you're never going to have that one notation system where always works. Okay, you sort of have to acknowledge there's different styles. I like to, in my work, that if you're a starting student, I like to give you a base notation. When you work with professionals who've always already developed a comfort with a particular notational style, you have to learn to adapt that. So for example, I'll say use C for cost of contribution, but you may want to use reward or gain or something like that. So you know, this is where you sort of have to be very careful. But I pay attention to how the probabil probabilists use notation. I use capital W because they like capital letters. Uh, I use X for decision because the whole math programming community uses X. It takes a long time to, you can't avoid all conflicts, you try to minimize them. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.